This is Physics 1020-1090, and it's the lecture for Friday, April 17th. Here in this first video, we will talk about the solution to practice exam 4A. Remember, the question numbers are randomized, so everybody might have a different order of questions than what I present, but this is just the happens to be the random selection that I got. Question one, and I will write out the question in black ink and the answer in blue ink. Uh, sometimes I won't write out the entire question because I just, just takes a long time to write it out. I've, there should be enough information so you can identify it. What scientist built the atomic pile in a squash port court in Chicago is the first controlled nuclear chain reaction? Well, that's just knowing who those eight scientists are, and that was Enrico Fermi, the Italian scientist who um, both did experiments on bombarding neutrons into various elements and then went to the United States and worked on the Manhattan Project and built the first nuclear chain reaction in Chicago. Question two. Uh, Einstein's theory for the photoelectric effect was revolutionary because, well, the answer is it was revolutionary because it was based on the particle nature of light or introduced really the idea of photons. Planck had done a little bit along those lines, <clears throat> but Einstein really introduced this idea that light has to be quantized. So this is an example of a history question which isn't just give you a bunch of choices between uh, different scientists, but you have to know a little bit about something that Einstein did and the significance of it. So I do expect you to know uh, what the significant main advances of those eight scientists are. Einstein is one of the eight scientists, so it was fair game. Question, back to Enrico Fermi, bombarded uranium with neutrons, and he got more reactions on a wooden tabletop than a marble tabletop. Why? Well, I want you to have watched that uh, video about the Chernobyl uh, nuclear disaster, and this was discussed in the Chernobyl uh, video. And it, the main point was that slow neutrons are more effective than fast neutrons in a lot of nuclear uh, reactions. So what happened was hydrogen, which is a great at slowing neutrons, that's why it's such a good moderator in reactors, hydrogen in the water that's inside wood slowed the neutrons down more than the, uh, el the elements in the marble tabletop. <clears throat> Question four. Uh, you have an isotope that decays has original value of n at time equals zero, and it decays down to 0 0.035, 0 0.035 n at a time 183 minutes. What's its half-life? Well, you have the equation that the number at some time t is equal to the initial number times e to the minus the rate constant times the time. So I put in the, t the number uh, later time, which was 0 0.035 times n, equals the initial number, which was n, e to the minus lambda rate constant times 183, which is minutes. Okay, you can divide the n's out. And so then you have to take, uh, get rid of the exponential by taking the logarithms of both sides. So you end up taking the logarithm of 0 0.035. And when you take the logarithm of this side, you just get minus lambda times 183. Well, the logarithm of number less than 1 is also negative. So when I solve for lambda, the minus 183 comes downstairs. And when I calculate the logarithm, the natural log of 0 0.035, I get minus 3.35. Do the division, the minus signs cancel. I get the, gate, the rate constant is 0 0.0183 inverse minutes. And then there's a relationship between half-life and the rate constant, which is 0.693 divided by the rate constant. And you do the calculation, you get 38 minutes. Notice a few things. First of all, you don't need to convert to seconds. All you have to do is consistently use minutes for the time and the half-life and inverse minutes for the rate constant. As long as you use the same units for all the times and rate constants, 
you're in good shape. You don't have to convert to seconds. Second of all, you do have to be familiar with your calculator. That's the natural log. If you use log base 10, you'll get the wrong answer. So I got 38 minutes. <clears throat> Question five. You have a rock. It's spherical. It's at a temperature of 545 Kelvin. It has a radius of 45 centimeters. Emissivity of one. You're supposed to calculate the power. Well, this is where you got to go back to that earlier chapter, back in uh, earlier in the book, where you find Stefan's law. So you want to make sure that you know how to find that. And the power radiated is the Stefan Boltzmann constant times A, the area, times the emissivity, times the fourth power of the temperature. I find the Stefan Boltzmann law is kind of hard to find because it's not in the list in the appendix, so you better know how to find it in your book so that if you need it, you can get to it. 5.7 times 10 to the minus 8. These funny units, but they're the units that it needs to have in order to give power in watts. Then the area. Well, the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. That's the surface area for a sphere. So there's your 4 pi. Convert the centimeters to meters. Get 0.45 quantity squared times the emissivity 1 times the temperature 545 Kelvin, which isn't that hot, uh, raised to the fourth power. And what you get is oh, 12,080 watts. Or if I had given it in kilowatts, it'd be 12.8 kilowatts. So it's radiating quite a bit of power, but that's mainly because it's a great big rock. Uh, but it is uh, it is not all that hot. Notice the temperature was given in Kelvin, so everything's good. Um, so again, make sure you know how to find that Stefan Boltzmann constant if you need it. You may get an answer that's not exactly the same as mine because of round off errors. I mean, this is five significant figures, um, but it should be clear that one of them is going to be much closer to the multiple choice answers than the others. I don't give two multiple choice answers that differ by just a tiny amount. So uh, you rounding off, as long as it's not extreme, shouldn't be an issue. <clears throat> Problem six, nuclear reaction that fuels the nuclear power plants like Chernobyl. Well, all our nuclear power plants, including Chernobyl, including the ones down along Lake Erie, uh, here near us, they're all fission nuclear power plants based on nuclear fission uh, of uranium. Uh, but that's not, you don't really need to know that it's uranium that's undergoing fission. The answer is just had you choose between several selections and one is fission. Nuclear fission is what runs our nuclear power plants. Problem seven, wavelength shift of the X-ray scattered off an electron at an angle 150 degrees. Okay, first of all, you have to realize that this is what this is talking about Compton scattering. Didn't use the word Compton in the problem, but it is when you describe what's happening. This is exactly Compton scattering. You got an X-ray that scatters off an electron. Angle is 150 degrees. It asks for the wavelength shift. By asking for the wavelength shift, it wants delta lambda. Not the wavelength of any x-ray itself, but the difference between the wavelengths is equal to, and this is the Compton scattering formula, Planck's constant over the mass of the electron times speed of light times 1 minus cosine theta. So you got to be able to look up Planck's constant, the mass of the electron, that's one that you got to have, speed of light, and 1 minus cosine of 150 degrees. Make sure your calculator is in the degree mode, not radian mode. And you calculate 4.5 times 10 to the minus 12. And all the answers were given in nanometers. So you convert that to nanometers. That becomes 0 0.0045 nanometers, which is definitely down in the uh, x-ray part of the spectrum. But that's the wavelength shift. <laughs> Okay, problem eight. Ernest Rutherford fired an alpha particle, aluminum. He saw uh, deviations from his scattering formula when his kinetic energy was 6.2 MeV. So what's the radius of the aluminum nucleus? Okay, so this is a distance of closest approach a problem. You can say it's, here is the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. When the alpha is a long ways away, it's all kinetic. When the alpha stops, it's all potential. Coulomb's constant. The charge of the nucleus is e times z, the charge of the alpha, 2 times z, over the distance, the distance of closer approach. Well, 
First of all, you need to know what the atomic number of aluminum is. You can find that in the appendix at the back of your book. Aluminum is element 13. You need to get the kinetic energy into joules because you're going to have to have it in joules to use this equation. 6.2, and remember that's mega electron volts, so it's 6 times 2 times 10 to the 6. And then you have to convert that to joules. You get 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So you solve this equation for D, you get Coulomb's constant, you get 2 times 13 or 26, you get the charge of an electron squared, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 squared, and divided by, when you bring the kinetic energy down to the other side, your 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 13, where you've got it into joules now, and you get 6 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. 10 to the minus 15 is a femto, so you get 6 femtometers. Problem nine, nuclear reaction uh, that powers the sun. The sun's powered by fusion, two hydrogens banging together to produce helium. Nuclear reaction that powers the sun is fusion. Problem 10, a problem with it, uh, Henry Mosley did. Uh, so he found that the uh, energy of the K-alpha uh, uh, x-ray is, and I gave you this equation in the problem, z minus 1 quantity squared times 13.6. So suppose that Mosley saw a wavelength of the k-alpha 0.03 nanometers. So that's definitely an x-ray. What's the substance? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to find the energy of the k-alpha. So that's hc over lambda. In other words, h times frequency. 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34, 3 times 10 to the 8th, divided by 0 0.03, and remember you convert it to meters, 10 to the minus 9. That gives you 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 15 joules. But we're going to need this in electron volts, so I convert that to electron volts, and you get 41, 250 electron volts. Okay, so you now have 41, 250 electron volts equals Z minus 1 quantity squared, 13.6 electron volts. Well, bring the 13.6 to the other side, Take the square root of both sides, and then you're going to have z minus 1. So you're going to take the minus 1 over to the other side, and you get a plus 1. So you're going to get 41250 over 13.6 square root plus 1 equals z. Z gives you 56. Then you go look at the appendix at the back of your book, and element 56 is barium. So Mosley was looking at barium. All right. Here's one that had a picture in it. Uh, you have this spectrum where this line is at a 122 nanometers and you're trying to find the uh, wavelength of this line, which isn't given. Okay, and it says that light in the ultraviolet, ultraviolet uh, 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 part of the spectrum from hydrogen and it wants to know what's the lambda over here. Well, this is a little bit complicated because I don't actually tell you what uh, energy levels the transitions are between. But if you remember that in the Balmer formula, I had you going down to the second level, and that was visible light. So these are going to be even larger energies. So you're going to expect that you're going down all the way to the ground state. That's what's going to give you the largest energy. So you can kind of check that. We're going to assume our hypothesis will be that we're going to be going to the ground state. Let's try that for this 122 and make sure it works. 1 over lambda is Rydberg constant and this first spectral line, the, the largest wavelength, so the lowest energy would be going from 2 to 1. So 1 over 1 squared minus 1 over 2 squared, well that's going to be 3 fourths times this and you'll get this for 83 times 10 to the fifth, but that's the reciprocal of lambda. Take the reciprocal, you get 121. So that's consistent within at least the accuracy of what I've calculated it. So we know now that we have the right spectrum. It's going down to the first, n equals one is the final state. Well now, out here is gonna be where this ends, and this ends when n is very large. Let's just set n equal to infinity. So now we get one over lambda is the Rydberg constant, one over one squared, because we're still going down to the first level, minus one over infinity squared, which is just zero. 
So we just get the Rydberg constant, and you take the reciprocal of it, and the reciprocal of the Rydberg constant is 91 nanometers. So that's the answer, 91 nanometers. Just let me stress, over here I've shown these are the energy levels for hydrogen. This would be N equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. So first we did this ray with 122 nanometers. We took energy level 2 minus energy level 1, and we found, yes, we got that. Then this line would have been 3 down to 1, this line 4 down to 1, and so on. And when all these lines end here, it's going n equals infinity down to 1. It gives off the largest energy photon or the shortest wavelength, 91 nanometers. Another one with a picture. Okay, he wants to know what energy of electrons is produced. This is going to be a case where you're producing X-rays by bombarding a tungsten target with electrons. What's the energy of those electrons? Well, this is our spectrum of X-rays given off. It's got a couple characteristic lines, but those don't matter here. Basically, we, if the lowest wavelength or highest energy X-ray corresponds to when the electron comes in and gives all of up all of its energy one time to a single X-ray. So that's going to correspond to this minimum wavelength. Well, there's zero, there's 0 0.04, so this looks like about halfway between them, 0 0.02. So we're going to estimate the minimum wavelength is 0 0.02 from the graph. Let's find out what energy that corresponds to the uh, X-ray photon is. HC over lambda. We've done this calculation several times before. Remember to convert to, nano, uh, to meters. And you get 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 15 joules, which you then convert to electron volts, 61,875 electron volts, which if you write it as kilo electron volts is rounding off 62 kilo electron volts. So... You have to get the data from the graph. Sometimes you actually have to get numbers from the graph like you did in this case. So it's important not only to know how to plug numbers into the equation, but to be able to look at the graph and tell qualitatively what's going on. I want you to be able to do that. This is the photoelectric effect. You have a wavelength of 357 nanometers light, shines on the metal, has a work function 2.4 electron volts. What's the kinetic energy of the electrons that come off? Well, first of all, we need to find the energy of the photon that goes in. HC over lambda, same thing that we've done before, convert to electron volts, 3.5 electron volts. This is a lot lower, it's a lot longer wavelength. It's up in the, near the visible, so it's a lot smaller energies. The energy of the photon is equal to the work constant, the energy that it takes to pull the electron out, plus the kinetic energy that flies off with. Solve for the kinetic energy, we just get the photon energy minus the work function. 3.5 minus 2.4, that's given. The answer is 1.1 electron volt. That's the photoelectric effect. Okay, this problem was asking about the ultraviolet catastrophe and which graph, and there's a bunch of graphs. So here is the red line is the Planck spectrum, the black body spectrum. It's small at real short wavelengths. It's small at really long wavelengths. It has a peak, and that peak depends on the temperature. Now, the classical theories matched the um, Planck spectrum at long wavelengths. So that if your classical result agreed at long wavelengths, but as you got shorter and shorter wavelengths going in, shorter wavelengths going into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, the classical prediction was grossly off. It never came back down. So this would be the picture that corresponded to the explanation for the ultraviolet catastrophe. Um, I should note a couple things. First of all, the answer just consisted of a bunch of pictures. You have to select one picture. And also, I found it a little bit difficult to keep track of where the dots are relative to the picture. So you want to be real careful if you have a question like this on the exam that you go through and make sure that the little bullets that you click on are the correct one for the picture. So just be real careful about that. That's the ultraviolet catastrophe. Okay, this is a wine displacement law calculation. You have a star with a given temperature. What is the peak of the black body spectrum at what wavelength? Well, you have the wine displacement law, which is the, the maximum wavelength peak 
times the temperature equals this constant. And this constant is also not something that's in the appendix. You have to go and look, find it in the chapter. So you might want to remember what that constant is. Uh, then you can just solve it for lambda max by dividing by the temperature. I get 0.47 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, but the answers are given in nanometers, so I convert to nanometers, I get 470 nanometers is the peak temperature. Okay, problem 16. Uh, neutron, uh, excuse me, nitrogen 13 decays by beta plus, positron decay. What does it decay into? Well, here's nitrogen 13, and sometimes I like to write it in this notation uh, because that has the atomic number down here as well as the mass number. A positron can be written as an electron with a plus one for, for a uh, uh, atomic number and a zero for a mass number. Remember, those aren't real numbers. They're just bookkeeping devices. But if you have that, then you can figure seven on this side. It's got one already. It's going to have six. And you have 13 here. So it's going to have 13 here. So you get an element that has Z equals six, A equals 13. That would be carbon 13. If you look up what is element number six, it's carbon 13. Another way to do it is to say that this has... Uh, not enough nu nu neutrons, so a neutron turns into a proton. A neutron turning into a proton will increase seven. Uh, excuse me. Um, it has, uh, yeah, not enough neutrons. So a proton is going to turn into a neutron. A proton is going to leave, bringing seven down to six, but the total number of protons and neutrons remains the same, carbon-13. So positron decay goes by carbon-13. Remember, beta plus means positron decay, beta minus means it ejects an electron. Problem number 17. All I say is thorium-231 decays by beta minus to what? So again, here I'm writing thorium-231 and I look up thorium in my appendix of the, or on my periodic table, that's element 90. And if it goes by beta minus decay, it ejects an electron, which for our bookkeeping has a minus one subscript and a zero superscript. So 90 has to give you 91 minus one or 90. 231 and zero is 231. I look up element 91 in my periodic table or in my appendix, and I get that element 91 is Pa or protactinium. So this is protactinium 231. I do not make you memorize all these elements. You have all that information in the appendix of your textbook or in a periodic table. But you do want to be comfortable grabbing the information and being comfortable interpreting that appendix because, as you see, we've used it several times. Okay, here was, I told another isotope of thorium, thorium-230, and I say it decays by alpha decay. So you have thorium-230, again, thorium is element 90. It's going to decay by alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus, 2,4. And then you have to add up the same on both sides. So 90 here, 2, that has to be element 88. This is 230, here's a 4, so this has to be 226, and this is radium, element 88 is radium, you get radium 226 for what the product is from alpha decay. All right, uh, problem 19, you have calcium 40 and calcium 48 are both stable. It's very unusual to have such a large difference in the number of neutrons and still have both isotopes be stable. Why is this? Well, calcium 40 has 20 protons, that's the, that's the atomic number of calcium, and if this is 40, that means it has 20 neutrons. Notice, 20 is one of the magic numbers. So this is particularly stable because they're both, it's a mad, doubly magic, magic, magic. Calcium 48 is 20 protons and 28 neutrons. Well, 28 is also a magic number. So both of these, by coincidence, are doubly magic. That's why these two are so stable, even though they have such a vastly different number of neutrons. So the answer is they're both doubly magic. It's, it's r r somewhat rare, but that's the example for calcium. So you do want to remember these magic numbers. And again, they are not in your textbook. At least I don't remember seeing them in the textbook. So you might want to make a note of them on your notes so you can find them if you need to get to them quickly. 
And pro last problem is uh, phosphorus 32 is an isot uh, radioactive element at a half-life of 14 days. After 100 days, what fraction of the initial amount of phosphorus 32 remains? Well, uh, you have a half-life of 14 days. Let's get the decay constant. It's 0.692 over 14 days or 0 0.0494 one over day. You don't have to mess with trying to figure out what that is in seconds. That just uh, gives you an opportunity for errors. Let's just use as our time unit days and rate constant in one over day. So your fraction is going to be the number divided by the initial number. And that's just going to be equal to this exponential factor, e to the minus lambda t. So e to the minus rate constant, which we have, and the time was given in the problem, 100 days. You multiply them together, the days cancel, and you just get e to the minus 4.94. Do that calculation, you get 0 0.0071, or I gave the answer in percent. So that would move the decimal point over two spots and 0.71 percent. So that is the problems. Then what I did is I checked it, clicked on submit my answers, and lo and behold, I got a 19 out of 20. It turns out that on the problem that I was supposed to answer radium 226, I clicked on radon 226, just not being real careful and getting radium and radon mixed up. So the, the moral of the story is even I who made the test and in teaching the class can click on make a stupid error. You have three hours, double check it, triple check it, quadruple check it. Make sure you have your answers exactly the way you want before you click on submit and get your final score. Okay, we will have one more video which will be going over practice exam for B.